So we are going to start now. Welcome back, everybody. So the first speaker of this afternoon is Frida Welker from the Globe Institute of the University of Copenhagen. And he's going to talk about ancient hominin, a bit the kind of follow-up of what um, Jean-Jacques has started to evoke. Ancient hominin proteomes, a novel frontier in human evolution research. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Thank you as well for inviting me to, to be present, although digitally and at a safe distance from, from all of you. Um, this morning was great to, to follow the, the meeting, uh, so I hope that the afternoon is just as pleasurable. Um, I'm Frida Welker. I'm a researcher here at the University of Copenhagen, and I try to study human evolution using ancient hominin proteomes. Um, so probably one of the take home messages is that we live in extraordinary times and not just because we are social media consuming bipeds, but also because for most of our evolutionary history, there were actually multiple populations or species of hominins present. And Jean-Jacques already mentioned this, we live in an extraordinary time period in the sense that only our population or species exist. Uh, but for most period of time, if we would go back, either within Africa or outside of Africa, there were multiple hominin populations present that either interacted with each other because they geographically and temporally overlapped or that adapted to specific local environments. And so from a paleo paleontological point of view, it's extremely interesting to try and understand how these different hominin populations relate to each other, biologically speaking. At the same time, we would of course like to understand how these hominins behaved. Uh, for example, when it comes to prey acquisition um, and resources, bone material as a resource, um, and proteins have the potential to provide some insights into that, as, as Shanshak pointed out. Um, and similarly, particularly for more recent time periods, it's of interest to understand how the genus Homo evolved its cognitive abilities and started to express these enhanced levels of con cognition within the material culture record. Um, and the bone ornaments from both Grotturen and Bachakiro are a case in point here where proteomics is starting to provide such insights. Um, and arguably, if we, if we just stick to the evolutionary story here, um, the past two decades has seen a major resurgence of our understanding of hominin populations from a molecular point of view through ancient DNA sequencing. So the ability to not only understand the evolution of these hominins from a morphological perspective, but directly from a molecular perspective, has changed the game in terms of how we understand, in particular, the middle um, and the late Pleistocene archaeological record. Um, and that has led to the generation of ancient genomes of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and ourselves. What is important, though, to realize, and this was pointed out earlier this morning as well, is that DNA is a relatively fragile biomolecule, and that means that for time periods of relevance to the emergence of uh, the genus Homo and how many population divergences within our genus, regions such as Africa, Southern Asia, and Eastern Asia, where large parts of that process take place, are inaccessible simply because DNA does not survive in these regions for the time periods that we're interested in. If we go to a more uh, environmentally favorable preservation areas such as Europe, where we have temperate climate conditions, ancient DNA might survive for 100,000 years or several hundreds of thousands of years, um, but not very much further back in time. And that means that even in the most extreme calculations one could make, ancient DNA of relevance to human evolution survives for maybe 5% of the time that has passed since we diverged from the common ancestor we shared with chimpanzees seven to eight million years ago. And the other 95% of this time frame are really inaccessible through ancient DNA research. And this is where our interest from um, the protein point of view derives from. So ancient DNA or genetic research in general is useful because of sequence variation at the genomic level from individual to individual within a species or population as well as from individuals in separate species and populations. Um, but in life, when that organism is is working and its cells are still uh, living in, in the body, uh, parts of that genome will be uh, transcribed into RNA, which we cannot access over geological timescales, and parts of that will be then translated into protein sequences. Um, however, some of the, the nucleotide genetic sequence variation that exists at the genomic level 
will therefore also be um, present as amino acid sequence variation at the proteomic level, which means that some of the evolutionary and phylogenetic information contained within the genome is also accessible within the proteome. The main caveat here, of course, is that not all proteins are expressed in every single tissue, and so there's a massive reduction in information content when we go from the genome to the proteome. Still, if we have an ancient sample, for example, a tooth sample, um, current methodologies allow us to sample part of that um, skeletal tissue, extract the protein from it, uh, modify it through a variety of steps to make it suitable for protein mass spectrometry analysis. And basically what the protein mass spectrometry will do is generate tens of thousands of MS2 spectra uh, that contain information on the protein sequence that was originally present in that sample. So we can then use a variety of bioinformatic tools to reconstruct an ancient protein sequence and compare that ancient protein sequence with other protein sequences from different individuals or organisms, and then use that as our input for um, phylogenetic reconstruction. Obviously, we're dealing with ancient biomolecules here, and so we have to be extremely careful when it comes to potential contamination of our ancient proteins. So, for example, of course, when the organism enters the burial environment, it will be colonized by microbes and fungi and other sources, um, and those will all leave behind their own proteins as well, in addition to uh, their DNA, for example. And so when we do, when we analyze an ancient fossil specimen, it will contain contaminating proteins from external sources. Likewise, the moment such a skeletal um, element is excavated by an archaeologist or handled by a student or curator in a museum, again, proteins from external sources will likely be deposited onto that skeletal specimen. And so we have to watch out for the presence of such proteins. Uh, finally, to at least circumvent any contamination happening within the analytical environment, we tend to work in ancient DNA grade laboratories with separate spaces for separate um, activities. We wear uh, protective uh, um, equipment. We use sterile consumables, etc., to minimize the impact of protein contamination within the laboratory and mass spec environments. And if we take such measures, um, correctly, that enable, enables us to extract and analyze ancient proteins from now extinct organisms. And in the past years, this has been shown for a range of mammalian species, including entire environments that nowadays do not exist anymore. Um, and in, for each of these examples that you see here, there is no very little ancient DNA preserved in fossils of those species, but there, are, there is actually protein preserved. And in each case, ancient proteins then allowed us to determine the phylogenetic relationships of these extinct species with other extinct species or with extant species that are still living on the planet today. Um, and this process doesn't only work for um, faunal or for non-human animal remains, it also works for great apes and humans. So here we see, just as an example, a particular protein that we uh, sometimes identify in enamel proteomes. And we have a part of the protein sequence on the right-hand side for a number of great ape species that are listed on the left-hand side, um, in addition to macaques. And as you can see, once we go through this list of species, the protein sequence differs from species to species in a way that is reminiscent of their evolutionary relationship to each other. And this is based on genomes that are available for these species that allow us to predict what the amino acid sequence of this particular protein would be. Similarly, through the advent of ancient DNA sequencing and the sequencing of tens of thousands of modern humans that are alive today, we can make similar uh, predictions for the protein sequences present um, in modern humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. And of course, such populations are vastly more closely related to each other than any of them are to other great apes, and so there's far less sequence difference between Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans. Still, in some positions for some proteins, such sequence differences do exist. What protein mass spectrometry allows us to do is to basically retrieve a similar set of information without any genomic data being available. So we can go to an ancient hominin for which there is no DNA preserved, sequence the proteins, and reconstruct the same protein just from the protein mass spectrometry data alone. And of course, these ancient proteins are fragmented, which means that parts of that protein sequence cannot be retrieved and cannot be observed, while all the parts of that protein 
uh, can be reconstructed. In fact, protein mass spectrometry allows us to observe novel amino acid sequence variation as well that is not observed in any genomic comparative database available at the moment. And that allows us to then, based on these protein sequence alignments, build a phylogenetic hypothesis on how this ancient hominin relates to other hominins um, and, and hominids as well. Um, and now I'm just basically going to walk you through a series of example studies that we've conducted in the past couple of years that have started to highlight the potential of this method. And I would really like to stress that these are team efforts. These are not done by a single person, but by large collaborations involving multiple institutions and, and countries. So my first example relates to the Denise events, and they've been briefly mentioned earlier today, I think. Uh, the Denise events are a very strange hominin population in the sense that we know them better genomically than we know them morphologically. And from a paleontological point of view, this is a very strange situation to be in. So until recently, Denise events were only known from a handful of hominin fossils from Denisova cave in the Altai mountains of Russia. And all these fossils are very fragmented, which means that it's difficult to compare them based on morphological data to the existing fossil record of Asia, for example. Still, uh, scientists have been successful at extracting complete ancient genomes from a number of these Denisovan fossils, which is, for example, informs us that um, certain populations in Asia harbor Denisovan uh, genetic material within their genomes, indicating past hybridization events. However, because these um, genomes are only found from a single cave site in Russia, it's currently unclear what the, pre what the past temporal and geographic distribution of Denis Denis Denisovan was, and which other hominin fossils in Asia might represent the Nisifans as well. Uh, and this is where this particular mandible is of interest. So this is the uh, Chaga mandible, which derives from Bashia Karst Cave in the lower reaches of the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayas from China. And is a mandible that was uh, recovered from a cave a couple of decades ago in a clandestine um, excavation. So it's not without direct archaeological context at the moment, um, and it preserves no DNA. But the Chinese colleagues uh, reached out to Professor Rublin and myself to see if potentially there was any protein preserved in this specimen, in the hope to elucidate at least something about the evolutionary relationships of this hominin mandible to um, ancient genomes available. The interesting point here was that morphologically speaking, this mandible and the teeth within it do not resemble modern humans, they do not resemble Neanderthals, and they're also not like Homo erectus. But because we didn't have any comparative material available for Denisovans, it was unclear whether or not this could potentially be a Denisovan. So we walked, we took a number of samples from the teeth and the bone itself, and walked and extracted the proteins from them, analyzed them on a protein mass spectrometer, and reconstructed the protein sequences for a small number of proteins that had preserved in this specimen. We then compared, compared those protein sequences to the protein sequences present in Neanderthals, Denisovans, modern humans, and other great ape species. What we found was that the Chaga proteins, ancient proteins preserved in the Chaga mandible, most closely resemble the protein sequences uh, predicted from the Denisovan high coverage genome. And this is to the exclusion of the same protein sequences present in Neanderthal populations or modern human populations, which gives us for the first time an insight into a significant part of Denisovan uh, skeletal morphology, in this case, the jaw or the mandible, um, as well as the morphology, of course, of these teeth. And this is important because it allows um, paleontologists now to make a larger comparison of morphological similarities between this mandible and other um, mandibles and teeth present within the fossil record of Southeastern and Eastern Asia. What is just as relevant though, is the age and the location at which uh, the Chaga mandible was found. So the Chaga mandible is at least 160,000 years old and it derives from a cave that's located over 3000 meters in altitude, which means that this is an environment with low oxygen concentrations, uh, with very sparse vegetation and low herbivore densities, even in the interglacial periods that we're living in right now. 
However, the Chach and Mandible derives from glacial time periods, which means that these archaic hominins, the Nisifans and their close kin, must have been extremely adaptive in being able to survive in an environment um, like this, particularly in glacial time periods. It pushes back high altitude occupation into entirely unknown and unexpected territory. My second example relates to Homo antecessor. So Homo antecessor is this hominin from Spain. Um, and in contrast to Denise Fence, there's actually a wealth of information available on skeletal morphology of Homo antecessor from this one site where this uh, fossil species has been recognized. But despite this wealth of morphological evidence, there, since its description uh, roughly two decades ago, there's been a continuous debate in the literature about the phylogenetic position of Homo antecessor in particular in relation to the emergence of the Neanderthal lineage and the emergence of Homo sapiens. And this could not be resolved just on morphological evidence alone, quite clearly. Um, but therefore, we were given the opportunity to analyze an enamel fragment from a fragmented motor from Homo antecessor. And if we do such a study, and we actually observe several signatures that allow us to be confident that the proteins we analyze are ancient. So one of those is protein fragmentation. And just like DNA or any other biomolecule, proteins fragment and fall apart over time. And we can observe this process directly in our data. So here we just see an example where we have multiple observations of the same protein region in um, the Homo antecessor sample. But you can also see that on the C terminal and amino acids have been removed, they have hydrolyzed off. And this is an indication, this sort of shortening of the protein sequence is an indication of, um, of diagenesis over time. Likewise, these proteins are, are not only fragmented over time, they're also modified over time, by which I mean the addition of uh, chemical compounds or the subtraction of such chemical compounds. And one such a modification that frequently is observed in ancient proteins is called deamidation, and deamidation can occur on two different amino acids, either on asparagines or on glutamines. We can quantify the levels of modification that we observe in our ancient sample, for example, on a protein basis. So we can count how often we observe a glutamine and in its unmodified form and how often we observe a glutamine in its modified form. If we quantify that for each protein, we will get an indication of whether none of the glutamines have been modified, in which case the percentage would be zero, or when, for example, all of the glutamine observations are of the modified form, in which case the percentage would be 100. If we then compare that measure for the two amino acids that can be modified in this way, for each of the proteins, we observe two clusters of proteins within our sample. We observe proteins that have no or very, very low levels of protein modifications with values close to zero. We also, however, have a group of proteins where the modification levels are above 50% for both uh, amino acids. So that means that in more than half of the observations that we have for that protein, we observe the modified variant and not the unmodified variant. And this allows us then just based on the modification levels to propose that these proteins where we observe very low levels of modifications or absence of modifications, that those represent contaminants, while the proteins with elevated modification levels likely represent proteins that have undergone diagenetic modifications over time and are therefore endogenous to the tissue that we try to analyze. This allows us to exclude all the potential contaminants from subsequent phylogenetic analysis, while we'll only use the ones that have elevated damage frequencies. If we take those proteins and reconstruct um, the ancient proteins preserved in the specimen and compare those to a range of modern humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and great apes, we can then come up with a phylogenetic hypothesis on the placement of Homo antecessor in relation to all the comparative specimens in the database. In this case, that indicates that Homo antecessor is likely a close closely related sister group of uh, modern humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, but is not more closely related to any of those hominin population, po populations, um, thereby settling the debate on where Homo antecessor fits in our evolutionary tree. 
what we can do even more with ancient uh, enamel proteins, proteome specifically, is sexing. So in the enamel proteome, there's a small number of proteins present. Um, and one of those is amylogenin. Now, amylogenin is interesting because it's located on both the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. And those protein sequences differ from each other. So in our Homo antecessor enamel proteome, we observe protein sequences that uniquely match to the amylogenin X sequence variant. And this is expected because, of course, both males and females would express this protein within their enamel. So that's all good. However, we also observe a number of protein sequences, sequences uniquely matching to amylogenin Y. And this indicates that the, amyl that the enamel fragment we analyzed must have derived from a male Homo antecessor individual. Something that would not be able, one would not be able to uh, determine just based on the morphological characteristics of the enamel fragment that we have access to. My final example relates to Gigantopithecus. And Gigantopithecus is a strange great ape a fossil species present in a very small restricted area of southern China uh, with a very interesting uh, literature on it in the, in, um, since its initial description in the early. 1930s. Uh, it's potentially the greatest great ape species that has ever lived, uh, but really the only fossil evidence that we have for Gigantopithecus are its teeth, which are enormous in size, as well as a small number of mandibles. And you see one of the examples here. Uh, and of course, just based on teeth and this very fragmented man mandible, it's difficult to conclusively propose where Gigantopithecus would be placed, evolutionary speaking. Although most likely based on geographic information, it could represent an early Pongo. Um, so luckily, we had the opportunity to analyze one of the uh, teeth from Gigantopithecus, extract the proteins from the enamel in the way that I indicated earlier, and reconstruct the ancient proteins, or the sequences of the ancient proteins preserved in the specimen. And if we do that, we indeed observe that Gigantopithecus, based on its protein sequences, is more closely related to the genus Pongo than it is to any other great ape species. We can even determine that in all likelihood it diverged from the genus Pongo somewhere in the middle to late Miocene. What is probably the most remarkable, however, is its age and the preservation conditions under which it was found. So the fossil specimen that we had access to is roughly 1.9 million years old, and it derives from a subtropical preservation environment. This is an environment that's extremely humid, uh, where the average yearly temperatures nowadays are above 22 degrees. Um, and this is therefore an environment that's entirely unconductive to biomolecular preservation. Still, these proteins survive and remain, by, remain phylogenetically informative over these extremely long periods of time, something that one cannot reach, for example, with ancient DNA. Um, and this has brought us now to basically the next five years in this research uh, line, uh, where we hope to reconcile and settle some debates in the, in the fossil record of uh, the genus Homo over the past one million years through an ERC project that I've been funded, where we hope to both develop some ethical and experimental approaches that enhance the recovery of ancient protein sequences, and then apply that to a range of taxa that have existed in both Africa, Europe, and Asia over the past one million years. Um, and before we really conclude, I would like to thank the true heroes of this research, which are the, or who are the, the scientists that allow us access to fossil specimens, even at stages where our research is still highly experimental. So my gratitude are towards Professor Sang, Professor Bermudez de Castro, and Professor Wang for making this possible. Um, and with that, I would also like to thank Enrico, Matthew, Jean-Jacques, Jasmine, and Petra uh, for their support over the past years, as well as all the funders, of course, uh, and you for listening. And I look forward to any questions you may have.